The graduate gardener class. This is intended for folks who have gardened at least one year or one season and want to delve deeper, get more out of their gardens, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but if anyone needs to use restrooms, go get water, go right ahead. Uh, I like to hold these kinds of workshops like a discussion. So if anyone has any comments, experiences they want to share, questions, anything like that, shoot them out when they come to you. We'll also have a QA and C session at the end, so if anyone wants to share anything at the end, we'll also try to save a little bit of time for that too. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have lots of things to discuss. So why don't we get started? Maybe with some introductions. My name is Cassidy. I'm from the High Country Conservation Center. I'm the community programs coordinator there. I've been gardening for most of my life. I went to school for agriculture. And then since coming up here, I've discovered all the wonders of gardening at altitude, <laughs> which is fun and exciting. I have worked professionally in the agriculture business for about five years before I came out here. Um, a variety of fossil fuel free farms. Uh, this is what Hurricane Irene did to Vermont. It's flattened all the corn and then put a semi truck at the end. It was a really interesting season that year. But yeah, so I have all of those experience that I'm able to draw on. I'll answer as many questions as possible. If you have a question that stumps me, which I challenge you all to do, I'll find the answer for you even if it's outside of class. I encourage everyone to keep talking to me even outside of this class because I just love gardening. So today's topics. We're going to talk about how, get, how to get the most out of our short season with succession planting. Uh, we're going to be talking about companion planting. Those are two really great techniques to get the most out of your garden bed, whether it's at home or a community garden. We'll be going over both of those. We'll also talk about a little bit of, with heirloom varieties, uh, some of the things that go into heirloom varieties, why I love heirloom varieties so much, a little bit about our seed library, which is brand spanking new. I'm going to send around couple brochures about it. Uh, we also have brochures next door in the seed library. Um, so make sure you check it out after today. And then we'll talk about some resources. Uh, that page that I sent out to you guys, um, if you don't have the resource page, I've got extra copies up here. Feel free to grab a copy. Um, it's great to reference things throughout the season, whether you're troubleshooting or you're doing your planning. It's great to make sure that you've got lots of resources. And then finally, we'll spend some time sharing with each other our experiences, um, things that we've done successfully, things that have been challenging for us, and just sort of have a discussion. So let's get into succession planting. So I'm going to do a little exercise. It's not homework, so don't panic. Just a fun little exercise. We're going to practice doing a succession planting calendar for lettuce. Everyone likes lettuce, I assume. We'll do that. Uh, we don't have a ton of copies, so maybe share with a neighbor. Partner up. So grab a calendar and that giant seed packet I printed out. Let me see here. I might have an extra pen. Does someone out there have an extra pen? There's pencils in the library. Oh, oh. oh okay. Oh, let's get everyone to share. Oh, right, right. So once everyone has a calendar and a seed packet to share with a buddy, we're going to do our own little succession planning. This is just an example of what you could do in a succession plan with. You can do it with anything, carrots, anything like that. The point of a succession plan is to get regular quantities of something you want to eat and not be overloaded all at once or have nothing all at once. Has anyone ever, you know, had a ton of lettuce all at once? Yeah. It all comes in at once and then you're like, oh my god, I can't eat enough salad. So this is a way of avoiding that issue. Uh, it's working efficiently in your garden, but mostly it's planning. So how much lettuce would you eat during a week? If we're talking about a leaf lettuce, so as opposed to a head lettuce, I'd say like a couple of plants, maybe three or four. Does that sound reasonable? A salad a day, something like that. Something like that, everyone likes salad. It's nice being able to grow your own lettuce, and lettuce is something that does really well up here at our altitude. If people grow lettuce at home or in their community garden plots, raise your hand if you've had some success with lettuce, wonderful. Quite a few people, yeah, those leafy greens do really well up here. 
So does everyone have their lettuce packet and their calendar? It ran out. It ran out? Okay. Maybe we'll share in threes or we can just listen. This stuff will be available online as well. So first, what I want everyone to do to give you guys sort of an idea of what our season looks like is we're going to write down our last frost date of the season. Does anyone know the last frost date of the season? Take any guesses? June 20th. Everyone circle June 20th on there. Father's Day is a good ballpark. Exactly, yeah. Father's Day, if you plan after Father's Day, you're totally safe. But we're graduate gardeners, so we might extend that a little bit. And then the other important date would be our first frost date. Does anyone know our first frost date? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, I have that August 3rd. So why don't we put August 3rd? So take a look at that time period, folks. We got a short season. We got a lot to get out of it. So with our succession planning, we're also going to be able to take advantage of season extenders. Do you guys know what a season extender would be? Maybe an example of one. Can someone give me an example of a season extender? Plastic. Water walls. Water walls. Has anyone seen those little wall of water things that go around tomato plants? Those are great. Plastic is great. Uh, also mulches are a great way to keep the soil warm. Plants like warm feet. They like to have their toes warm. Uh, a really great mulch would be straw. Do not use hay. You will be so sad if you use hay. Because hay has seeds and you will grow more hay if you put hay down. So if you're going to use a mulch, I like straw. But you can use a variety of different kinds of mulches. You can use newspaper. You can use all sorts of different kinds of stuff. So if we're using a season extender, I like to think that we've got a little bit more time to work with things. So let's extend our last frost date. Maybe put a circle around June 1st. I think we can get some stuff going and be relatively safe around that if we're using season extenders. And again, it's not a guarantee. As everyone observed our fabulous weather in summer, we get hail in the middle of July, all sorts of funky stuff like that. So nothing's a guarantee. Don't email me in the middle of July and be like, oh my god, it's all dead, it's all your fault. <laughs> don't do that too. I'll be very sad. And then we're going to extend our first frost date. Why don't we extend it to August 23rd? So circle that last, second to last Saturday. So now we've got a little bit of a bigger season. And then this is going to be our planning period. So it's really nice to have a planting calendar. Does anyone use a planting calendar already? Some people do. Yeah. So this is going to be an example that all you old pros who already know about planting calendars can share your experiences. This is going to be an example one for folks who have not done it yet. So let's look at our lettuce packet. Nice and big lettuce packet. The biggest lettuce packet you'll ever see. What are some important things on there to keep in mind while we're making our planning planting calendar? Can anyone take some guesses? Days till harvest. Yep. What else? There's one other thing on there that's super important for planting calendars. Uh, well, your germination is pretty important. Also. Exactly. So those two things, days to germination and days to harvest, throw a circle around both of those for me. And that information is going to be on any seed packet that you find. That's some really important information. So days to germination, what's that mean? until you're starting to get sprouts, so you need to keep those little seeds warm, because if you don't keep them warm, they're not going to germinate. Nice. Has anyone experienced transplanting before? Starting something maybe indoors? You have? Have you done it with lettuce yet? No. No, not with lettuce. Lettuce is a good one to do if you want to get a lot of lettuce. There are some things that are better to transplant than others. I'm going to be handing around another piece of information that we probably do not have nearly enough of, but this is also available online. This is a list of vegetables and herbs that successfully grow in Summit County and how to seed them, whether it's direct seed or transplanting. Uh, so pass that around. If you don't get one, don't panic. It's available online. You can also send me an email. I might just email everyone with 
these handouts just since we have such a wonderful turnout. So now that we've got days to germination and days to harvest, what do you think would be most important to start with? What do you think? We're making a planting calendar. Harvest? Harvest? Is everyone sort of in agreement? So let's plan on our last harvest, maybe being on the 23rd. Lettuce is relatively cold hardy. It can survive some frost, a little bit of frost, not too much frost. So why don't we circle the 23rd again and write our last harvest because succession planting, we're going to get multiple harvests. Our goal is to be able to harvest lettuce every Saturday. Would you guys like to harvest lettuce every Saturday? Go home and then you'll have salad for all your week and pack it for lunches and everyone can be super envious of the lunches you pack. Wonderful. So why don't we circle each of the Saturdays in August except for that last one. So 16th, 9th, and 2nd. So the 16th would be, an, let's say, our 6th harvest, 5th harvest, 4th harvest, and then we could also probably do a couple in July too. So let's circle the 26th and the 19th as both harvest days as well. So then counting backwards from our first harvest date, what would we count backwards to using our lettuce packet? Yep, so everyone count back 50 days and tell me what you land on. Count back from our first harvest. Tell me what you guys land on. May 31st. May 31st, May 30th, May 31st, right around there, yep. So days to harvest, so let's look at the 30th. That's going to be our transplant day if we choose to start these joggies inside. So does everyone circle that? May 30th, transplant outdoors. And then counting backwards, let's say we're going to plant them tonight at home. We've got little egg cartons or something we want to do. We could probably squeeze in something so we've got a little bit of a sprout and then we should be able to transplant maybe 30th, maybe early June, get them outside and that's going to create our first harvest in July. So if you guys wanted to sit here and do the math, we could count backwards again from the second harvest, look to see what we land on and then count back another 10 to 15 days and that would be our start date. Has anyone not done transplanting before? Raise your hand. Totally fine. This is a non-judgmental row. Awesome. <laughs> you can direct seed lettuce. So if you were going to direct seed instead of transplanting, you would direct seed instead of, so that day that we would start them inside, just start them outside. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Nope. I've got a shaking head. <laughs> okay, so transplant day is maybe May 30th or so? Yeah. And that then from there you back up to whatever the number of days to days to germination. Okay. You want them to be developed a little bit. You don't want just the colloidal leaves. Has anyone does anyone know what a colloidal leaf is? Can anyone describe it for the rest of us? It's part of the seed. It's part of the seed. It just looks like two little itty bitty leaves. Most colloidal leaves look the same on all plants. They're like itty bitty, bitty little guys. You want to at least look have it look a little bit like lettuce before you start transplanting things. What are some important things to keep in mind when you're transplanting for those who have transplanted before? You will because you're transplanting on the 30th, you are going to have to keep that soil warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because even though they budded, you still were not past the frost time. And we could always have a frost between June 1st and the 20th. Exactly. And that's where those season extenders come in. So the plastic that go over the plots, if you guys are community gardeners, one of my favorite ways to keep the plastic on, I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, but those clamps that keep people's towels on their like chaise lounge kind of thing. Uh, they sell them in magazines. Any sort of clamp will do, like really big paper clamps will also work. Uh, you just want something to keep the plastic in place and so it's not blowing all over hell and gone. Um, 
what were our other succession planting kind of transplanting keep the heat in techniques the mulch or the newspaper or the, the mulch what kind of mulch hay or straw mm -hmm. straw straw why straw because it doesn't have seeds because it doesn't have seeds <laughs> this is a quiz yeah um, those plastic milk bottles painted black that retain those are great, yeah, to keep the soil warm. If you're going to be transplanting and you want to keep your seedlings warm inside, I find an electric blanket does really well. Put an electric blanket under your seedlings. Uh, you can get flats if you want um, from local nurseries. You can buy them online. Uh, you can also use egg cartons. You can use all sorts of different methods for starting your seeds off indoors. Or if you're direct seeding, there's a couple of different techniques for direct seeding as well. But the point is to keep the soil warm. So our season extenders in the beginning of the year, season extenders in the end of the year. So if you are going to be working on succession planting, and I encourage everyone to at least give it a try. Either take this calendar home, or you can print off one of your own for free. And map it out. Just do some planning. It's a great exercise. Even if it doesn't work out for you, if you miss some dates or you're, you know, trying to get things going right, you know, that's when you want to be experimenting. That's when you want to be trying these new kinds of things. So don't let anything stand in your way. Does anyone have any succession planting questions? Yeah. I have a strange question. An experiment we did was we cut out, I buy parts of grooming, we cut it off, and we put it in water, and it started growing. Same huh. with celery. Yeah. As those grow, can, I've never done this before, it's an experiment, it grew inside in the water. Can I put that in the dirt? You certainly starter? can. Okay. You can certainly transplant it out of the water into the dirt. You want to make sure it's really moist, okay. the dirt that is, when you're putting it in there. And be really, really careful with the roots. If anyone is, remembers root systems from when they were in school and you know they all the tiny little spider webs, those are really important. That if you're disrupting root systems or being, you know, really harsh with them, it's like cutting off your own fingers. Like it's really painful, and yes, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to die, but it might hold you back a little. Thank you. Yeah. Any other succession planting questions? No, yeah, I was going to say. Oh, <coughs> sorry. I was going to okay. say to Joanne, I think that on that, just like if you were to grow leeks. You want to at first kind of mound the soil up a little bit to kind of protect it. And then with leeks, it still stays mounded. But with that, I think then you start pushing back. Okay. But when you first start, I think on that. Great. You mound the soil. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful. I started with this inside. I've got a zillion plants for so But no, I got rid of them because I was afraid of destroying the leaves when I, I mean, the roots rather, when I pulled them out. So I should have kept them. Were they in individual spots? Yeah, Was it like one plant per holder? No, no. They, were like they were all mixed together? They would probably have a challenging start in life. If you've got like a big pot and you fill it with lettuce, then those roots are all going to get connected and get all tangled together. Uh, so those might not have done so hot. So I think you're spot on with that intuition. So. This is something I'll email out to everyone because it's really, really tiny. But uh, this is the planting calendar that our CSA farmers use here. So this gives you a general idea of how you can set something up, a one-page thing, once you sort of play around with that calendar type of thing that I gave you. You can then map it out and you can see, okay, well, my arugula, I'm going to be planting on this day, and this is what I'm going to be harvesting. Um, just making yourself a calendar. Whether it's for you know the big stuff, like when you need to sow your seeds and when you're going to transplant, to even the little stuff, if you're a fairly forgetful person, maybe putting on there watering and weeding. Those are very important things, too, that we cannot forget about as graduate gardeners. Um, so I'll make sure everyone gets a copy of that as well. So next up is companion planting. Who's heard of companion planting before the technique? Does anyone want to give us a little story about what it is? Well, well just as kind of the word says, it what goes together. Yeah, what so goes together and what doesn't go together. Or not fertilizes, but um, impregnates each other and keeps each other going. And yeah, it keeps yeah. each other happy. The plant, the best friends of the plant world. 
So has anyone done experimenting with companion planting in their own gardens? A little bit, some people have, some people haven't. That's totally fine. So there's not a lot of like conclusive scientific evidence backing them up, but companion planting itself has been used for centuries. Uh, a great example are the Three Sisters. Has anyone heard of the Three Sisters companion planting? You have? Nice. We did a pool in first grade. Oh, you it didn't did? So well. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, when it does work out well, you've got three things. you got corn, you got beans, and you got squash. So the corn serves almost as a trellis. It's something that grows up, it's nice and sturdy, it's got a nice long tap root too. Things that go straight into the ground. Uh, the beans climb up the corn. Legumes fixate nitrogen from the atmosphere. Has anyone heard that before? Why do you think that might be important to incorporate legumes into whatever you're growing? <coughs> it replenishes the nitrogen to your soil. It does. It's one of the few ways to get nitrogen from the air into the soil. Legumes do it for free. So legumes, those are going to be your beans. Uh, white clover is also a great ground cover. So that kills your weeds, also fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. So beans are awesome. So the beans climb up the corn. The beans are feeding the corn and the squash. What do you think the squash is doing? Think about the way that squash grows. Grows on the ground. What's it doing there for these other two guys? It's sort of serving as a mulch. It's covering the ground and keeping the weeds out. So we've got the corn that grows up, the beans that grow up, the corn fixate the nitrogen, the squash covers the ground and keeps all the weeds out. This is a great example of companion planting. It shows how plants interact in a positive way. So there's lots of different ways that we can do companion planting. Corn doesn't do so hot up here, for those who are wondering. I'm just going to ask. Yeah, I corn, eh, I would not try. Unless you want those little tiny corns you get in the buffets. <laughs> Might be all you get. They work well in the greenhouse, though. They do work well in the greenhouse. Get the tall greenhouse. Tall greenhouse. Um, there are lots of things that do well up here, though, that are really great companions. Um, I find that if you think about smelly things, Smelly things are great to put around the edges of your garden. Those are great ways of deterring pests. So some smelly things that would be good, anything from the allium family, so those are going to be your onions and all those kinds of things. Um, anything sort of pungent smelling. And we've got a lot of other things that repel bugs and stuff like that that we have issues with. Nasturtiums are great to keep away aphids. Has anyone had an aphid problem before? Aphids are the little tiny bugs. Some people in the back are nodding, yeah. Nasturtiums are a really great way of deterring aphids. So if you have had an aphid problem in the past, or if you just like nasturtiums, nasturtiums are those beautiful flowers that you find in fancy salad mixes. Has everyone seen those before? They're usually like orange. They're pretty, and I think they taste horrible, but that's just me. When I was little, I called them nasty urchins. Nasturtiums. <laughs> There are lots of other things that go well together. Uh, things like lettuce and radishes do well together. Beets and broccoli, Swiss chard and beans, turnips and peas. Those are all really great things. And some of it's understood why they go well together, some of it not so well. My favorite book for this topic is Carrots Love Tomatoes. That's a really great companion planting book. Uh, some other things that are good at repelling bugs. Has anyone ever had a flea beetle issue around here? Some people have, some people haven't. Flea beetles are not so much fun. Catnip does really well at deterring flea beetles. So in a lot of these things you want to protect your plants so it's great to have these kinds of smelly stuff around the edges. Um, so also think about enemy plants. So just as there are companions there are things that don't do well together. <coughs> so things like beets and beans so hot together. Uh, carrots and onions also don't do too well together. So there's a lot of resources online and I suggest that if you would like to delve into the world of companion planting for your garden this year, do a wide search of research. There's some stuff that's founded and there's some stuff that's just the guy on the internet who's spouting his mouth and doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you see something like three or four places, then I'd say it's probably decent knowledge and to go ahead and give it a try. So if you, yeah? Uh, do you have any ideas for a deterrent for voles? Mmm, a deterrent for voles. I do actually. I have a very interesting one. If you can locate the vole hole, 
grape double bubble gum. Whoa. Works really well. Drop it in the hole, no wrapper. They eat it, and it's so big and so sticky, it gloms up their digestive system, and they just keel over in a day or two. But make sure you throw it in the hole. You don't want your dog eating it or the kid next door to pick it up and eat it covered in wood chips or whatever. Because so we, we have <coughs> holes at the garden that have picked up. Which garden are you in again? Breckenridge. Breckenridge, yep, I remember that. Half radishes, half carrots, things like that. Okay. And they have eaten. We need them there too. Well, that would be a great place. There's not, I mean, animals aren't supposed yes. to be at the community gardens. So no, if you, it's not an animal, it's an underground animal. Yeah. yeah. So, but the bolt has to come up at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're able to locate a hole, I suggest the gum. Unfortunately, voles are more of a preventative thing, and I don't think it was really thought of too well when the Breckenridge Garden was built, but putting uh, like a layer of chicken wire or something under the bed is a great way of deterring them. But once they're already in, grape double bubble gum, but also those smelly things. So uh, a smelly root crop would be a great way of deterring them. So make sure you put things in like chives and onions and all that sort of stuff, leeks. Any of those powerful smelling things will sort of deter them. You know, you think about taking a bite of an onion you know, oh, your eyes start to water. And same thing happens to them. I have raised beds in my uh, backyard. Yep. And I have a neighborhood cat <gasps> that likes to come over and use the raised beds for a poop box. Eggshells. Eggshells? Yeah, they cut their paws on them and they don't like it. Okay. So eggshells are good for any sensitive kind of animals. If you think about a cat's paw, like it's not all callous like a dog's is. Uh, also works well for deterring snails, any sort of eggshells like that. If they get past the eggshells or if they're just jumping over them or they're really tough cookies, anything like that, also gives your garden some good calcium source. Uh, take a piss around it. Works really well to deter animals. <laughs> Whether you want to do that outside or indoors and then bring it outside is up to you and your neighbors. Just but uh, you're marking your territory, literally. Welcome to the animal kingdom. And don't call me if you get arrested for indecent exposure and say that I told you to do it. I'm not coming to pick you up. So if you're getting into the world of companion planting, I suggest start by making a list. Your top favorite five or ten things that you want to plant and focus on those to do your research. Write down next to them, you know, what's good, what's not. I did hand around some companion planting information. I'm just going to hold up, hold up yours here. Uh, 32 companion planting tips. So if anyone hasn't got this, I do have a couple of extra ones. It has a list of who their good neighbors are. It's very handy. <laughs> so, and that's available online as well. I'll make sure to email out all of you this handy dandy stuff. So what if the companion has a totally different profile of uh, germination and maturity for the person that you talked about? Mm -hmm. doesn't you just kind of keep backing up your calendar to try to figure out when to get them both to go in the ground? They don't have to. They don't have to. At the same time. Exactly. They don't have to mature at the same rate. Okay. So as long as they're going in and they're developing somewhat similarly, like, I mean, you know, we're, we're sort of confined in the amount of days that we have. So most of the stuff that you're going to be looking to plant are going to be relatively short days to maturity anyways. So you want to just plant them next to each other. It's a lot easier here than if you got a year-round season because you don't have too many options. But they don't have to mature at the same rate. That's a great question. Any other companion planting questions? This is also another very tiny chart that I'll send out everyone copies of. This is one of my favorite ones. The handout that I gave you guys is good, uh, but this is also really nice. Basically, it's, you know, you go up and you go over and you can see if they're companions or not. So you're able to get a lot more information. I'll make sure to email that out to everyone too. Any other companion planting questions? We're moving right along. Heirloom varieties. What's an heirloom? Does anyone know? <gasps> an old plant. Non-GMO variety. Non-GMO. Genetically modified organism, right? Has everyone heard that term? GMO, genetically modified organism. We have a lot of genetically modified organisms. We've got a lot of genetically modified plants. 
we've actually got a lot of plants that are patented. Uh, I think this is a very dangerous thing that the world is doing, patenting DNA, uh, because it's not nice. Plants should belong to everyone. So that's why I'm a big believer in heirloom plants. Heirloom plants are non-hybridized. They've been protected and preserved by neighborhoods, communities. Uh, they're really interesting things. You know, that's how you get tomatoes that look so different all over the place. You go to the grocery store, you might see a little bit of a variety, but you're not going to see all the different varieties of tomato that there are in the world. There are so many different kinds. So I think it's really important to maintain heirloom varieties. And it's also really fun because if anyone is into saving seed, has anyone saved seed before from a plant? Got a couple people who have? Nice, nice. Yeah. I have a question. Are you going to maybe uh, teach about that? How to harvest the seed? Because I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there will be a seed saving workshop come fall. There's also a lot of resources in the seed library next door. Has anyone checked out the seed library yet? A couple people have. No, some. With your library card, you can take out up to five packets of seeds for free. And then here comes the other shoe. There we go. Uh, the other shoe is that you need to then return the seeds. So by returning the seeds, I mean save the seed. We'll have classes available. There are books. There are online resources on how to save seed. And then you're going to return them to us and we'll put it back into circulation. The point of saving seed is almost to, I guess you could say, climatize the genetics to your area. So here we are you know at altitude and we've got really tough growing conditions and somebody tries to grow a tomato plant and they get one tomato but if they save seed from that one tomato that made it up here the next year someone grows those seeds out you might get two tomatoes on each plant if you save the seed from the best looking tomato again that cycle we might end up with a frisco tomato <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but that's how you get those kinds of varieties. Uh, some of them require some different treatment, uh, but most of the time they grow just like their brothers and sisters. They might be a little bit more difficult because they haven't been hybridized. Uh, they don't have that hybrid vigor. Has anyone heard the term hybrid vigor? You want to explain it to us? Hello? Hello? <laughs> well, it's a genetically engineered plant that... that is grown for a specific characteristic, whatever that may be. Exactly, yeah, so it's specified either from genetics. Um, hybrid vigor can also mean when a plant is hybridized with another kind of plant, the first generation is super quick, it has great vigor, uh, and then if you try to save seed from it, then you'll get two different kinds of things. So for example, tomatoes, if I hybridize them together, uh, I might get an interesting new kind of tomato plant, those open pollinators. And then the next season, I might not get the same thing. It's really interesting stuff. So if anyone's interested in genetics and stuff like that, we won't talk about too much of it today. I'd be happy to talk about it at another time if anyone is really interested in Mendel and those eighth grade science stuff. <laughs> Takes us all back. Is there any questions about heirloom varieties? Has anyone ever had a really fun heirloom variety that they want to share an experience about, something that they grew? I just wanted to share that a lot of people attempt to just put, say, miracle Grow when they're fertilizing their tomato plants, but tomato plants actually have fertilizers specific to the plant. So if you really are gun ho and you want the tomatoes to grow, you need to look into getting tomato plant fertilizer. And that tomato plant fertilizer has a lot of nitrogen. It's very high in nitrogen. Um, another great way of getting fertilizer, if you're community gardeners, your plots are already fertilized. Uh, you can fertilize further by using either a compost tea or a vermiculture compost tea. So does anyone do the worm composting at home, vermiculture compost? Those are the worms at home. Uh, worm castings, those are really rich in nitrogen. Uh, anyone doing stuff at home who wants to do some fertilization, high country compost, it's a local compost source. You can get it up at the scrap that's 
18 bucks for a cubic yard, something like that. Uh, so it's really great stuff. Uh, filet mignon with compost. It's really good. It's nice. It's very nice. Do you use it at yeah, home? It's excellent. And they actually do a quarter inch as well. So a quarter inch screen, that's great for lawns too. So if anyone needs to give a little life to their lawn, that's another great source for that. They do uh, sell mulch up there as well. Does anyone have any heirloom questions? I encourage everyone, once we're done here, uh, to either ask me questions or go over to the seed library. It's over here in the main branch. They're open until 7, right? I think yeah. so. Yeah, so you'll have a half hour to look over there. Yeah? Um, are there heirlooms for high altitude? There are some. Not as many as there could be, though, because there isn't as much high altitude growing. But there are things like, you know, hybridized heirlooms, so heirlooms that are crossed with others, uh, that do well in drier climates. Um, so we definitely fall into that sort of scenario during the summertime. But that's the thing. That's the seed library. We can make our own. And that would be considered an heirloom variety if, you know, you take home a pepper plant and you get one pepper and you save seed from it and so on and so on. That would eventually be considered a high country heirloom, which is pretty cool that we can do stuff like that. That's people's selection. Yeah. Do seeds last over a period of time? I right? So you had a big package of seeds and let, you know, let us carry whatever it was doing well, but you only used half of it. And so you put so, it in the garage and then next year you come out and you're going to try it again. Should we just start fresh seeds? Or? First year, they've got the ultimate germination rate. Second year, they're going to lose a little bit of germination and then it's slowly going to drop off. I say once you've had it for four years, get rid of it. Four years, I think, is a good cutoff as long as you're keeping them in good condition. That's low humidity and cool temperatures. If you're keeping them in, you know, the sauna, then they're going to die after a year because they're going to sprout. But if you've got low humidity, cool temperatures, I think your seed packets should be fine. You'd have a decent germination rate four years. If you're concerned about it, plant a little extra. Worst case scenario is that you can just pluck them out of the ground if you've got too many if they're encroaching on each other. A great question. So moving on, last but not least, trellising. Does anyone have experience in trellising either in your community gardens or at home? A couple people do. You can trellis so much more than you think you can trellis. Trellising is an awesome way to get things up. What do you think the advantages are of getting things up? Space? More room. <laughs> more room? What else? More production. More production? Less mold less pests because when you've got them up you're going to have more airflow more ventilation the plants actually do a lot better too because more leaves are going to have access to that good old sunshine so trellising is awesome yeah and if you trellis um certain ver certain plants next to other plants that might need less than 100 uh, percent direct sunlight you get a little bit of shade or filtered sunshine for the plants down below that's a great point too you can put up some shade it's wonderful to put up shade where you need it. Definitely. All those are really great. It's also a lot easier to find the stuff that you want to harvest because you're not down here picking through stuff. You know, you're, it's up and it's in front of you, so it's a really great way to be able to find all the goodies. So trellising in community gardens. Make sure you speak to your neighbor if it might interfere with your neighbor. Uh, you don't want to put up a trellis and have them come in the next day and be like, oh my god, I'm never going to see the light of day again. Uh, don't do that to your neighbors. But you can also share trellising. Uh, some good trellising might be a metal fence kind of thing, you know, with the small holes. But you can get inventive. You know, we've got some crutches here. Uh, those are always good to use to hang your trellising on. Uh, you can use wire. You can use string. Keep in mind that the string might not do so hot towards the end of the season once it's been watered and rained on. Uh, string tends to degrade. Um, don't use baling twine from if you get straw for your gardens you might get baling twine. Baling twine is treated uh, so that it won't degrade but it will also make your plants really unhappy and they won't want to touch it. It's really hard to trellis a plant that doesn't want to touch your trellis. It's a really interesting conundrum. I had a very difficult experience with it. So learn from my mistakes. But there's lots of ways of trellising things. 
Uh, think about smaller than a volleyball. If it's smaller than a volleyball, you can probably trellis it. Since we don't do so hot with you know big old pumpkins and cantaloupes and stuff like that up here, you can trellis things like cucumbers. Uh, if you want to try the tomato, you can do that. Uh, you want to do like a smaller trellis, something like this. Um, or those metal baskets, those circular ones are also good for tomatoes as well. Has anyone trellised any unusual stuff? Any unusual trellisers? Beans, peas, has anyone trellised those? Those are great easy ones because they've got those curly little fingers that just want to grab onto everything. And the sugar snap peas. Yeah, sugar snap peas. <laughs> and those are great for kids because they can eat them right off the vine. You get that instant gratification. Yes. Yummy. And there's <laughs> yum. Yes, all of those good kind of things. Um, you can get into some interesting stuff though. I'll tell you a funny story, make you all laugh, and this will make you remember the whole class. Uh, growing, I tried trellising pumpkins once, just to see what would happen. And I had to sacrifice a couple brassiers to the pumpkins, and it worked really, really well. <laughs> Luckily I had a friend who had pumpkin-sized brassiers. <laughs> See, so now you guys won't forget this class. You'll remember it forever. So that resource sheet that I gave everyone, those have a lot of information about where you can get, you know, books, places you can go, Summit Landscaping and Rack, Hydro Shack and Frisco, Alpine Garden Center and so forth, Thorn, just to name a few. There's a lot of other great nurseries to get information from. Uh, if you're going to be buying transplants, make sure you ask some questions. Uh, things like hardening off. Has anyone ever heard of hardening off with transplanting? Mm -hmm. You want to explain hardening off to us? You put it outside for a little while so it gets used to it, then the next day you put it longer. Yeah, exactly. And the good time to do hardening off here, put it out during the day, bring it in at night. We still have really cold nights, uh, but during the day they get used to things like wind. Uh, they get used to things like the elements. And that whole hardening off process can be really important if you're buying transplants. You could also do hardening off at home just by bringing them inside and out. But make sure you ask questions about where your plants are coming from. Are they organic? Have they been treated with pesticide? All that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, websites, things like the Summit Garden Network. Has everyone been on that website once or twice? There's a lot of great resources on that website. Uh, there's a tab at the top that says resources. You click on that. All of our videotape workshops are on there, uh, lists of websites, YouTube videos, stuff like that. Uh, some of my favorite YouTube videos, Summit Garden Network on YouTube. We have a channel with all of our videos. Um, there are also some other great ones on there. We also host a variety of workshops, this being one of them, all throughout the season. Has anyone bought their seeds yet? Put them out yet? Some people have, some people haven't. There's a couple of really great places to get seeds, make sure you know about where your seeds are coming from. Uh, if you're able to get organic seeds or you're able to get heirloom seeds, just pat yourself on the back because I think that's taking the good step in the right direction. Uh, Johnny's Seeds, has anyone heard of that seed company? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people have. They've got a great catalog. I know I should be conserving paper, but their catalog is so beautiful. It shows everything in color, and it's a really great way to see what, what you're able to get. And they've got so many different varieties. You can get purple carrots and purple green beans. You can have a whole purple garden if you wanted to. Oh, she's holding up her phone. What do you got back there? Johnny's. Johnny's? I looked it up just before I got here. Oh, good. Yeah. Isn't it cool? You don't even have to get the paper. You just look it up on that. Oh, good. <laughs> we can do that. We'll conserve paper. Uh, some books, things like Seed to Seed is a great book for seed saving. It is like the encyclopedia of seed saving. You basically look up what you have and it tells you how to save seeds from it. So lots of good stuff. Um, Eartha's Lending Library, if anyone has been to our office before, if you haven't, make sure you come by and say hi. We're open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. We have a bunch of books that have been donated to us. Feel free to come by and look at it. Uh, you're more than welcome to take a book home with you. You're welcome to just look at it as a reference. All sorts of good stuff like that. Does anyone have questions as to where they should go from here? Do you have a favorite local resource for um, some organic fertilizer? Mmm, high country compost. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it really is my favorite. 
It is locally sourced. It's a mixture carbon nitrogen, as everyone sort of got the basics of composting. Uh, it's a mixture carbon and nitrogen. Carbon is all the beetle kill that we have here. And the nitrogen is food scraps from schools, our residential food waste recycling program, as well as businesses that give us a bunch of food scraps too. Um, and so that and a couple other ingredients are all mixed together. It is a great fertilizer. Um, we only amend our community gardens every other year, and everyone does wonderfully in those. Uh, we've got a great source of nutrients with that. So with that compost, because I use it also, you say every other year, not every year? I use it uh, one inch every other year and throughout our community gardens. Okay. Is this, is this the year, or was last year the year? It depends on which garden you're in. Uh, Breckenridge, that's this year. Yeah. Does it hurt if you do it every year? It won't hurt. Like, you won't get nitrogen burn or anything like that. Um, but just like if you're taking a bunch of vitamin C when you have a cold, uh, if you take too much, you're just going to pee it out. So it uh, just could be a waste. Okay. But it won't hurt. Okay. It won't hurt. Do you want to turn the water on? They should be turning it on shortly. I don't know. Dave Asklin is the, the man of the hour over at CMC who's in charge of turning on the water. The issue with Breckenridge is that the hose above is above ground. So that's the challenge. We are still supposed to get some snow. Um, if anyone's doing direct seeding into their gardens outside, know that your seeds will probably hibernate for a little bit if it is cold. It might have a little bit longer of a germination time for this first round if you're doing succession planting or if you're just doing one batch. If the seeds are out right now, they're probably doing a little hibernation. Um, there's a couple of other great techniques. Um, again, I wish I had more of these. Pass them in both directions. But um, has anyone ever heard of square foot gardening? Some people have. Do you guys want to explain it back there? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's in a, it, you do each <coughs> session in, in a square foot. Yep. And you do different varieties of, I guess, I don't know. Um, this is sort of a little bit of a guide to square foot okay. gardening. I'm just going to steal yours for a second. I promise I'll give it back. Uh, the numbers represent the numbers of plants per square foot. Right. So this is pretty much your guide. If you're going to do square foot gardening, just hold some strings out, do a little measuring. Uh, it's also a great way to get the most out of your community gardens or your gardens at home. Uh, just make sure you can reach everything because if you can't reach everything, you're going to step on your own plants. So keep that in mind if you're using square foot gardening at home. Uh, anyone who's using square foot gardening in their community plots should have a very easy time reaching stuff. So to wrap things up, Q, A, and C, questions, answers, and comments. Bring your thoughts to the table. Yeah. I was just wondering, if somebody said you shouldn't plant the same thing in the same area every year, or are you supposed to move it Yeah. Around? So the reason why that is, so what you're talking about is planting the same thing in different places each year. Because once that thing uses its nitrogen or uses its phosphorus, whatever nutrient that it likes the best, once that's out, you want to put it in a new place because it's going to use something different. So yeah, if you're planting in the same place every year, think about moving it around a little bit. But this is also an opportunity to experiment, use some trellising, use some companion planting, maybe experiment with some new stuff. Um, so it's a great way to get some variety into the garden. If you do plant stuff in the same place each year, it's not as big of a deal as long as you're amending your gardens, which we do for the community gardens, and which I hope everyone does at home as well. So Those the amendments are garden, it's okay to put the same stuff because it's all. Yeah, we put in an amendment every year, so okay. there should be brand new nutrients okay. for them to be able to use. Okay. Yeah. And then are you going to be putting more of that compost in? Say what? What do you mean by amending? So amending is working compost or working a fertilizer of some sort into your garden. So for example, in Breckenridge, they worked in about an inch or two of compost into each of their plots. That's their amendment. So you're starting over, starting fresh, putting new nutrients in the ground. So um, Dylan Valley, I don't think anything's been done. No, they got it last year. They got two inches. So they should be all set. Yeah, every other year we find is what does the best. Yeah. Onions, uh, if you go with sets, 
sometimes you can go to a, um, a garden center and you can find sets of small bulbs about the size of the end of your finger. Mm -hmm. And you can also go and find what looks to be dried scallions bundled up. Yes. Comments either way for growing onions with either of those types of sets? I find that sets are a little bit quicker to develop in my personal experience. Does anyone else have experience they want to share with sets versus the little dry scallion looking guys? My sets do great. Well, I've, used, really I've used both. Do you have experience one way or the other? Yeah, they both seem to do well. Yeah. One. I found that my sets developed a little bit quicker, but I didn't find, you know, one and the other was awesome. It wasn't that drastic of a difference for me, but my sets definitely developed a little bit quicker into something edible. Um, I was reading something the other day on the internet saying that if you wanted to grow from sets, you plant deeper if you want scallions, as opposed to if you want the onion to develop into a bulb, you plant shallower. Never heard of that. Do you? Has anybody heard anything like that? Hmm, that's interesting. You know, I've planted usually at a, a similar depth, but maybe it's been median enough. I found that it's the duration that creates scallion versus bulb onion. Sure. Uh, yeah. The the article said if you're going to plant a set, plant it four inches deep. If you want it to produce a bulb, plant it two inches deep. Hmm. Just. I find that interesting. Maybe, did it say anything about mounding? No. Huh. Has anyone experienced a depth difference, scallion versus bulb? I, no. would, I would go with the four, and I would think that if you left it there long enough, you'd get the bulb. It's, I think if you go too shallow two inches, you're not going to get that bulb. Yeah, because the bulb, I, I just feel like once it comes in contact with the sunshine, it's not going to like it too much. No. Um, so yeah, a median depth, four inches, and then a duration if you want something smaller and sweeter versus if you want a bulb with something a little bit more flavorful. Any other questions? Yeah. Is heirloom organic? Oh, good question. So most heirlooms are organic. I would say like 99% of them are organic only because of the fact that most people who care about heirlooms also care about organic. You could have a non-organic heirloom, but it's very rare. Yeah. And are, oh, are the seeds marked over there if they are organic or not? Yeah, they'll say heirloom or they'll say organic. I also have, so once you go over there, and I, I might walk over with some people and give you guys a tour if you're interested, uh, but there's a little learning area with all the information about the seed library. And there's a big binder, and the big binder has all the original seed packets in them. Because we put them in smaller ones, so that way it's everyone, you know, gotten their big seed packet and they only use a tiny bit of it and then they have to store it for years and years. Um, we're eliminating that by taking each packet of seeds and splitting it usually into four. Um, so you get a nice reasonable amount of seeds. You should be able to use them in a season. Um, but yeah, we've got them all marked either on the package or you can look at the original on the binder. Back there. So if you're doing container planting to kind of get a jump start on the season and bringing them in at night. Yep. Is the artificial light from your house messing with the life cycle? Oh, good question. Um, at this point, it's sort of a nice help as long as you're not staying up to like two in the morning with the light on. Um, but having a duration of light actually can help, especially if you're growing stuff inside year round. If you're growing herbs in your kitchen in winter time, uh, having the lights on will make them think that it's not winter and we only have an hour of sunlight. So I don't think it would be a hindrance at all. Yeah. Uh, I grow snow peas and yeah. after after a while, I just let them go to seed, and I harvest the seeds. I've been doing it for three or four years now. Should I stop harvesting one year and buy a new seed packet, or it's not going to, I'm not getting a lesser and lesser product every season? No, you're getting a better and better product every season. Okay. Because if you're saving seeds from your best plants, that being said, if you're saving seed from your horrible looking plants and it's got shriveled leaves and terrible looking pea pods, 
then yeah, that would produce a lesser product. But if you're harvesting from good looking plants and you're saving that seed season after season, you're only going to get a better plant because you're selecting for the genetics that do best up here in our climate.